All right. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, all that stuff. Welcome to community. I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited to share the word. Man, I'm off like two bangs this today. Check like two bangs today, bro. I'm hyped right now. Um, I'm excited. Hey, Barry, I think it's kind of hot. A little bit. I don't want people to think I'm yelling at them. Uh, man, I'm excited to share the word today. Now, I got an important topic that we're going to talk about today. But uh, raise your hand if you've ever played any sport in your life. Jamil, you play sport? What you play? <laughs> okay. There you go. Who was name? Hey, call it out. Call it out. Karate. Karate. Kickboxing. Kickboxing. Okay, got a fighter back there. I'm kind of scared. Football. Cool. All right. Parenting. Okay. <laughs> Okay, y'all just naming stuff now. Now listen, every single team does this to prepare for their game, for their fight, for their match, whatever it may be. Raise your hand if you can name it. So they do this to prepare for their game or their match. Who can name it? Who can name it? Practice, that's one. Was it? Stretch, okay, that's another one. Um, that's not the specific one. I'm looking for a specific one. Ali, did you say something? Warming up. Okay, you got warming up. Okay, let me give you all a hint. Tom Brady, the Super Bowl winners, they did this to prepare for this. They trained. Okay, that's not it, though. Mental, they do. Come on, y'all got to get this. <laughs> oh, we're going to be here all night. I'm not going to get to my sermon until somebody get this. What is it? They fast? They fast? No, okay. I didn't know that. Hey, come on, come up here. Hey, what's your, what's your name, my bad? Vanessa, come up here, Vanessa. Yeah, give it up for Vanessa. Hey, you got a spiritual gain shirt. You sell this, that's worth like $500, yo. Good job. Watching film. All right, why would people, why do they watch film? To prepare. Study the opponent, right? Right? So they, okay, they, they watch film to study their opponent, and then once they view all their weaknesses or they view all their strengths, then they start to formulate that game plan around those things, right? It's typically what studying film is. Well, today, we are going to do that. We're going to study film, all right? So uh, everybody in here has an enemy. We all have an enemy. And... If you're unaware of that, you know what I'm saying? I'm here to tell you now. Every, you, everybody in here got something that is attacking them 24-7. You're on down to attack 24-7. They're looking for ways to catch you slipping. They are looking for any way to creep into your mind, into your house, whatever it may be. So this is actually an enemy that we do not love. We don't love this enemy. Because I know Jesus says love your enemies, but this is a different enemy. This is the enemy of God. This is the embodiment of every single thing evil, all right? So uh, we're going to read that. We're going to be in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Before you ever read the Bible, pray first. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for every single person in this room. God, I'm coming to you and asking for prayer and lifting us up uh, because we need your understanding. We need your wisdom, and we need to know what your word says so we can apply it to our everyday lives. Your word says anybody that asks for wisdom, it will be given to them. So, Father, give us wisdom, and we thank you in advance for this. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Amen. Amen. Cool. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. If you want to turn there or you want to click there, uh, I'll have it for you guys on the screen. So, here we go. Mark 5. They came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him, uh, him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to, to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, 
What have you do to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of the pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And he began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but he said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord God has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. That is the word of the Lord to the, today. Everybody say amen. 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 Cool. Now. That's a lot, right? Just 20 verses. My mouth is dry from just reading all that stuff. Now, <laughs> um, Bible tips. If you're new in the room and you're kind of just figuring out this Bible thing at church, you know what I'm saying, you're new, you're trying to explore the Christian faith, let me help you with how to read the Bible, all right? So every time you read the Bible, ask yourself these three questions, all right? It is, uh, what just happened? You want to understand the context, you want to know who's who, you want to understand what just went on, you want to know who said what, what happened to that person, what happened to these pigs, you know, figure out what happened, and then go from there. You want to understand the context. Number two is this, what does this tell me about God? Because the Bible is not about you. The Bible is a story about God and how God has revealed himself to humanity, so everything is, is, is about God. But there is a cool thing in there. It's because you're part of God's story. You're a part of God's story. So the third question you ask yourself is, what does this tell me about myself? All right? Now, 20 verses. I mean, there's a, something significant in every single line, but I got eight points for you guys, okay? Eight points. Eight points for you guys. Uh, let me break it down. Jesus is approached by a man with an evil spirit. He's possessed, okay? He's demonized. We all saw, like, the exorcist and all that kind of stuff, right? That's what's going on with this dude. So he's approached by a man with an evil spirit. Two, the man has supernatural strength and is rejected by society. People are tying him down with chains, with shackles, and he's breaking them. He's breaking the chains. This is like King Kong in the, in the ocean, Godzilla breaking them chains. Y'all watch that? Nobody watched that, okay. <laughs> HBO Max. Uh, three, the demon immediately recognizes who Jesus is. Demons know who Jesus is. Number four, Jesus sends the demons into the herd of pigs and they all drown. Poor pigs, poor lechon uh, bacon, lechon koali. Hey, anybody eat lechon koali? Bree, come on. Bree, me and you. Hey, we're the only ones. <laughs> uh, the man is back to himself and in his right mind. Okay, so Jesus heals this dude. Number six, people of the city see everything that happened and beg Jesus to leave. Get up out of here, Jesus. You're crazy. Seven, Jesus tells the man to go and tell people what God has done for him. And eight, the man goes and tells everyone what Jesus has done for him. That's the summarized version of what just happened, okay? There's some of the stuff that I left out, but for the most part, that's it. Now, that's what happened. First one is, what does this tell me about God? Now, I have the same point in every single sermon I ever preach because I believe this is the most important thing. Like, if you get anything from today, understand this point, okay? Because it's the importance of who God is. That way we can recognize who God is, you know what I'm saying? And, and then when you understand who God is, then that makes the deity of Jesus that much more significant. Now, uh, growing up all my life, I saw pictures of Jesus. My grandma had a million pictures of Jesus on the wall. You grow up in a Filipino household, you just got pictures of Jesus everywhere. You know how it is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
So you, I see pictures of Jesus. And then not only that, like, I watch, like, bad shows. Okay, I watch, like, Family Guy and South Park. And they all portray Jesus in a messed up way. You know what I'm saying? What happens to the points? Hey, Barry, help me out with this. Just press, uh, remind me later. So they're always portraying Jesus, and they always got an image of Jesus. Barry's not text Hey, Trisha, you're going to have to help him with that. <laughs> we need to go to the full screen. This is the devil messing with us, y'all. Hey, we think we're going to mess with it, man. Dang. I'll preach this thing off memory. It's all good. Um, but there's always an image of Jesus that's being portrayed, and when you see Jesus so much, it starts to minimize Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't, got, you don't get to see the full picture of Jesus. And so it's like you become desensitized to your image of him. Yes, good job, Trisha. Hey, clap it up for Trisha. She got it working, yeah. Okay, you, you showed him my point. You weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> um, so this is important. Image of Jesus is important. We don't want to minimize Jesus. That's dangerous because the Bible makes this point clear. Everybody write this point down. If you're taking notes, write this down. Study on it. Pray on it. Think about it throughout the week. When you're in the shower, everything. This. Jesus. Uh, the point is not working. Okay, see, the devil's attacking us. Hey, Barry, help me out with the, uh, the point. Good job, Trisha. Good job, Trisha. Hey, clap it up for Trisha again. Jesus is God. All right? Somebody's going to have to hang out back there because my point is tripping. Jesus is God. That's the most important thing in the Bible, all right? Understand who Jesus, G- Jesus is God. Ruler and creator of everything on earth. Now, where do I get this from out of this story, right? We just read about the demons that was like breaking chains and stuff. Where do I get this? Well, if we look at verses 19 and 20, next slide, please. Yes. Next slide. Yep. Okay. Verse 19, and he did not permit him but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord, Lord God has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And the demon-possessed man, I'm going to call him Jordan. All right, let's just, I'll just put myself in there. Jordan went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. Y'all see that switch? Go tell people how much God has done for you. So then Jordan goes and tells people how much Jesus has done for him. That makes sense, right? It's pretty simple. All right. Now, like, where else do we see that? Now, if we remember, if you was here about a couple weeks ago, uh, we, I, I, I preached about Mark chapter 4, uh, and at the end of the chapter, you know, it's Jesus and the d- disciples, they're going off into the sea and they're in the ocean and stuff, and then uh, there's a huge wave that comes, and the, at the command of Jesus' voice, Jesus calms the waves and the winds of the sea. And then right into the next chapter, what people were unable to, were unable to do, Remember, they tried everything. They tied tying them up, chaining them up, shackles, everything, handcuffs, all that stuff. They were unable to do that. But again, at the command of Jesus' voice, not only do the waves and the winds of the sea obey him, but the spiritual world obeys him as well. Why? Because Jesus is God. Look at Colossians 1. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Colossians 1, 15. He is the image, Jesus of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things, everybody say all things, things. were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Y'all see this point? Jesus is God. Y'all get that? Y'all clear on that? That makes sense, right? Put a bookmark in your notes. We're going to come back to this point. So we see Jesus is God. Now, what does this mean for the rest of the story? Like, what does that got to do with me? What do, how do I apply this to my life? Well, what do we do with the, the possessed person? Now, let me tell you this. This could be like a tough concept to grasp. It's hard to understand and hard to imagine. But uh, next point, this is what it tells us. Demons are real. Demons are real. Um, in no way am I a demonologist. I did not study demons. I'm going to hold a degree in demonology, you know what I'm saying? I personally have never encountered a demon person. 
I don't think. A few people that are like, oh, I don't know about two, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't know. Uh, but I do know plenty of people, like, that are in this room right now. You could tell, they'll tell you whole stories. They'll tell, write a whole novel on their life about how they've seen possessed people. So it's a very real thing. Um, now, my own personal experience with demons, it comes from movies. All right? I said it earlier, like, I watched The Exorcist and all that stuff. Man, hey, I watched The Exorcist when I was, like, six. My parents, like, kids in high school, uh, in, in elementary school, in, like, first grade, all the kids were, were shown, like, Nickelodeon scary movies, Cartoon Network type stuff. Uh, Cur- uh, Courage the Cowardly Dog, can you watch that? A little bit. Hey, Bree again? Bree again? Come on, Bree. <laughs> Okay, so people would talk about that. I'm like, bro, I watched The Exorcist last night. That girl's head was spinning around, throwing up green stuff. That's crazy. My parents would show me all that stuff. I don't know. But my, I have great parents, though. I'm saying, like, I love my mom. My mom's in the room. Mom, raise your hand. Yes, ask my mom. Hey. <laughs> my mom, I turned out all right, right? I think a little bit. I watched all that stuff, but I'm all right now. <laughs> but that's my experience with. Demons. I was watching, watching uh, Emily Rose, Exorcist, The Conjure, all that stuff. You know, so I watched all those movies. Uh, and maybe that's you. Maybe that's your only experience with demons. You saw all these movies, and you're like, eh, demons, that's like a, a Hollywood thing. It's not really real. Or maybe you see a bunch of quote-unquote extremists, Christian extremists, yelling on the corner, hey, the devil, you're the devil, you know, all that stuff. Hollywood is the devil. Musicians are the devil. You know what I'm saying? Like, you hear all those, like, every, like, you know, old people, they'll, they'll, they'll be like, hey, don't do that. That's of the devil. You ever you watch Waterboy? She's like, don't play foosball. That's the devil. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's our experience with, with demons. That's what we heard about. So it's like, uh, I don't really know if demons exist. Now, uh, let me tell you, as Christians, as followers of Christ, or maybe you're exploring the Christian faith, our stance shouldn't be, it's in the Bible, but I've never experienced, so therefore it isn't true. Our stance should be that. Our stance should be in total submission to God, to where if it's in God's word and we don't understand it, then we ask God, God, I believe your word is real. Please reveal and teach me the things that I don't understand. That should be our stance towards God in the Bible. God's word is truth. So establish that in your head, moving forward. De- demons are real. Well, it's, it's easy to, to know that demons are real. You see all these mass shootings and, you know, suicide bombings, all that stuff. God didn't tell them to do that. God is never going to tell you to kill innocent people. Never going to happen. So they're being influenced by something that is not of God. Demons are real. And so what do, what, how do we study this? What can, we, what can we know about demons? Well, point number two is this. It's like, demons are not for you. Demons are not on your side. It's such a, like a foolish standpoint when you see people, they're, they're in such rebellion to God and his people that they'll take the stance that the devil is actually on their side. Everybody saw that, like, that Lil Nas X video where everybody's twerking on the devil and all that kind of stuff, high heels. And all the Christians got mad at it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, that's been around. Like, demons been, like, influencing the music industry for, like, years. That's nothing new. But it's just a foolish stance to think that demons are on your side. They ain't. They're trying to to destroy you, okay? Um, Now, all throughout the Bible are examples of demonized people. And demons are trying to do pretty much two things, y'all. Demons are trying to get you to hurt other people. Or hurt yourself. That's what demons do, man. Hurt other people, hurt yourself. I guess there's a sub point, like, get you to not believe in God. I think I got this one in my notes. Anyways, okay, you think about God's, Jesus' two greatest commands is love God and love others, people. Satan's greatest command is to hate God and hate others. Isn't that an interesting contrast right there, right? So if we look at verses 3 through 5. He lived among the tombs. Bro is living in the cemetery. You know what I'm saying? Like, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched them apart. 
and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. He can't hurt other people. He's tied up. He's cast out from society. So now I'm just going to hurt myself. You know what I'm saying? So uh, demons are out to try to get you to hurt other people or hurt yourself. Now, that could come in a number of different ways, all right? I think that's a, a clear point that we got to distinguish. It comes from different ways. It's not always just physically. Demons will attack you uh, mentally, emotionally, especially spiritually. Especially spiritually. Demons can attack from these, all these different aspects. Now, if we read John chapter 10, all right? Uh, next point. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. But with this, demons, the devil, it's not always going to present itself in a way where you could be like, yup, that's the devil. It's not a red dude with horns and a huge fork. It's not going to always be like that. Demons will present themselves and put things in your head uh, that sound good. They'll give you everything you wanted. Demons can even promise prosperity in your life. Ain't that crazy? Demons will promise prosperity in your life. You might even get it. But they're still demons. So what does that tell us? Next point, demons are deceptive. They're liars. That's the demon's goal. Demon wants to take what is evil, what is against God, what is sinful, and make it seem like it's actually a good thing for you. That's why it's important to know Scripture, y'all. You got to know Scripture because if it's not in alignment with Scripture, then it most likely isn't coming from God. Straight up point right there. If it's not in alignment with Scripture, most likely not coming from God. Now, here's the thing that sticks out to me. Uh, verse 8 through 9. Uh, For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, a legion is a name of the old school Roman army. It's like the biggest unit of the Roman, Roman army. And that ranged from about three to 6,000 soldiers. There's 2,000 pigs. Now, does that mean that there was potentially up to like 6,000 demons possessing that person? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's possible. It doesn't say. What's going on back there? It doesn't say. But what is for sure, okay, what is for sure is that there's multiple demons in this person. That's for sure, okay, there's multiple demons in this person. Now, I'm kind of speculating here, okay. This is like my guess. This is my educated, like, hypothesis. Hypothesis, hey, that's not like a fancy word. Hypothesis, okay. So theologians in the room do not throw tomatoes at me if I'm wrong right now, okay. Guess right now. Okay. Now remember, the point is, uh, next slide, Trisha, demons are deceptive. Okay? Point is demons are deceptive. Now, might be the nature of the devil possessing, it could be, but here's another possible avenue. I believe that how you could get a legion of demons to mess with you, a whole gang of them, is when you're dealing with a demon, you recognize it, you experience all the bad things that demons bring, you hate it, but you turn to other things other than Jesus to drive it out. Troubles of life hit. So let me just turn to these drugs and these alcohol to solve these problems. Well, now you got the spirit of alcohol, the spirit of drugs in you. I heard something this week. Uh, man, at Bible study, we, someone said that they be like witches will pray over crystal meth in order to make it more potent. I was like, dang, what? That's crazy. So the spirits, so you're inviting all kinds of spirits when you, when you mess with drugs and alcohol like that. You compromise your mind. You open the door for something in your life spiritually. Or maybe you feel like you lack something in life and you need value. Like I say this all the time. I think like the, the idol in this day and age is sex and relationships. It's the idol of this day and age. And when you have sex with people, you're joining spirits with them. You're inheriting all the different spirits that they got in them. 
No, you take that on, and now that's your issues. That's why you could have been, you could have been like good, happy person. Then you have sex with somebody, and now all of a sudden you're, all, you're always depressed. Bro, you're joining spirits with somebody, and you're inheriting all the spirits that they have, sexually transmitted demons. You know what I'm saying? Psh, it's crazy. So watch out for who you're sleeping with, man. Like, that's why it's important to know who God is, be secure in God, and know all that stuff. And don't just go giving your, your spirit or let other spirits dwell into your temple. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe, okay, maybe it's all uh, two of those or you're doing those things and none of those. You feel like you're being attacked. You feel all the negative uh, you know, effects in your life. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn and burn something up in my house to remove and drive out all the evil spirits. Let me burn this sage up real quick. Let me get rid of all this stuff. Or, you know, let me, let me see what these, this deck of cards says about my life. Let's see what, they, what that's going to say. Man, that's an invitation to more spirits that are not of God. Man, I, 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 listen, man, hey, this is community church, right? Community church, we exist to develop worshipers of God. That's why we're here. If you're here for the first time, bro, like, we've prayed that you would accept Christ. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's why we're, we are here. Now, we desire every person in here to be submitted to Christ for the sake of you. We're not going to really benefit like that for, by trying to convince you to join this church and take all your money. But we ain't even handling the money like as much as we should be. We ain't even tithing here. <laughs> that's why we got to make more announcements about tithing, bro. We don't need your money. We want it for the sake of you because Jesus changed his lives. You know what I'm saying? So we exist to proclaim the message of the gospel and how Jesus is the way, the truth, and the what? Life. Why am I passionate about this? Because there was a time not too long ago where I believed in the theology of Christianity. I believed in the apologetics of Christianity. If you don't know what apologetics is, that just means like, you know, why the proof of evidence and why God exists, why Christianity is true. But I did not believe in the power of Jesus to where he actually wanted to change my life, to where he cared about what I do in my life. Y'all see the difference there? My theology, on point, I think. Imelda always says something bad about me, I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but theology is on point. I believe in apologetics. I could defend the faith, but I didn't believe that God really cared about me what I do in my life. And so what did I do? Knowing all this theology, knowing all these Bible verses, knowing spiritual gains, I turned to sex and relationships, and I tried to find value in what others thought of me, and cared about who others said I am, rather than who God said I am. It wasn't until, like for real, for real, surrendered my life to Jesus, said I'm tired of turning to things to avoid my problems, to help satisfy me, only to end up feeling broken, used, and empty. And I put this on everything. When I surrendered, I experienced the love and power of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Things I battled with and I was addicted to since I was like nine years old, destroying my life. Times in my life where I was down and depressed, uh, hating myself, hating life, to where I felt like the only way I could shake this feeling off is if I died. That's the kind of torment, I, the things I experienced, that kind of depression. It's like, you know, anybody watch Get Out? Nobody. Nobody watch Get Out. Bree again. Bree again, man. Hey, Bree, come up here, Bree. Come up here, Bree. <laughs> Clap it up for Bree. <laughs> yeah. We got to serve for Bree. Um, uh, put, put, put some pep in your step, Bree. We, we kind of waiting on you, yo. <laughs> Preach your cane shirt. Appreciate you, Bree. Clap it up for Bree one more time. Hey, she gets all my references. She gets the spiritual games. You definitely are your spiritual games shirt for that. Now, you watch Get Out. There's a thing called the sucking place, and it's like a dark hole where everything around is black, and you're just falling down and falling and falling and falling. That's what I felt like. That's my experience. What I felt like when I would turn to these things, I would literally feel like that. Felt so dirty. I felt like, again, I felt like dying. But 
the goodness of God that comes in, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit takes over you, and you experience freedom from things that you were a slave to, you experience victory over things that pinned your life down, and you experience joy that's greater than, life, than anything that life has to offer. See, people, man, people are scared to commit to a godly life. Like, I don't want to go to church because then I might have to make some changes in my life. You know what I'm saying? Like, I still want to party and wild out a little bit. They feel like they're scared to commit to a godly life because they feel like they're going to miss out. And they can't go to parties anymore. They can't get high anymore. They can't go out and sleep with whoever. So they're just going to avoid committing to a godly life. And so a godly life is, is reduced to a bunch of rules to follow. It's reduced to not doing the bad things that you really want to do. But let me tell you this. This is not what it means to follow Jesus. To follow God and to live a godly life is to long for and experience daily, not once, not just on Sundays, daily. You want to experience the goodness of God and the love of God because that's better than anything else this life has to offer. So if it ain't that, if it ain't God, I don't even want it. If doing this is going to hinder me from experiencing God, I don't want it. If doing this separates me from God, I ain't even going to do it. You see how that changes everything? It changes its perspective. You see God is greater than anything this life has to offer. Now you don't even desire those things anymore. That is the power of Jesus. That's the power of Jesus. And so we no longer are going to really emphasize on demons Unless, like, we're talking about beating them down. Like, anyone ever been in a fight before? You can admit it. Anyone been in a fight? Yeah. Imagine if you're in a fight, right? And uh, this fight is hyped up. You know, people in high school, they're talking. Uh, other dude was talking all this smack to you on, like, MySpace and AIM and stuff. I remember AIM. That's just my time where fights were organized. Uh, <laughs> they talk about how bad they're going to whoop you. They're telling everybody how bad they're going to whoop you. But as soon as you see them in person, they apologize and beg you not to beat them up. What's I'm all that stuff he was talking? This is the situation with Jesus and the demons. Verses 6 and 7. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Other translations say, don't, don't torture me. What does this mean? Next slide is this. Jesus is Lord over demons. See, there's a misconception out there that there is a war in the spiritual world. That is God versus the devil. That's the big fight that we all kind of picture it, right? Like that's bigger than Mayweather Pacquiao. That's bigger than uh, John Jones, Francis Ngannou. You know what I'm saying? Hopefully there's some fighters in here. That's what we picture God versus the devil like. Now, I'm here to tell you this. That is not at all a big fight because Jesus has dominion over everything he created. The fight is not between God and the devil because God already has victory over that. The demons see Jesus and immediately give up and beg them not to torture them, right? But... There's just but, but there is a fight. And on both sides of the spectrum, you do have God and you do have the devil. There is a fight over you. But a very specific thing about you is over your faith. Devil is trying to take away your faith. Now, let me tell you something that like we all, every person in this room, we live by faith. We all live by faith. Now, what does that word faith actually mean, right? Because we throw that word faith, right? You just got to have faith. You know what I'm saying? Someone's got a tattoo on us. You know what I'm saying? We can get it on a shirt. Faith. You know what I'm saying? What does that actually mean? It's a word we see a lot. And I'll agree, it's the answer to a lot of things, just that faith. That's true. That's true. Like a simple definition of it is, is belief, and that is true. Keep doing that. But let's bring it down and break it down to where it's a little bit more simple, all right? So all of us literally live by faith every single day. Now, about three weeks ago, 
me and my roommate Joseph, we went to L.A. We drove to L.A. Each of us have both driven down there multiple times in our life. But it's like a five-hour drive. It's like 400 miles away. So do we know exactly how to get there and make every turn and get on every freeway by heart? No. So what do we use? GPS, Google Maps, Waze. I love Waze because they tell you where the cops are. I like speed. <laughs> the thing is accurate too. Um, I love Waze. Um, I thank God for these things. Because back in the day, I remember I had to go on MapQuest and write each, down, each direction down. Anyone remember that? That was crazy, yo. <laughs> you had to write it down, and then if you missed, like, one turn, oh, your whole trip is ruined. You end up lost. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, okay, we got GPS, and mid-drive, Joseph says, dang, bro, I don't know where this GPS is taking us. I've never been this way. But it's short, and it cuts our arrival time by, like, 30 minutes or whatever. Now, we arrive at the exact time that GPS told us and at the right place. Like, can you believe that? Like, we completely trusted in an app on our phone that we have no understanding how it works, where it gets its information from. No idea on this information if it's actually right, but we trust it anyway. Now, can you imagine if we didn't have a GPS? Imagine if we had no GPS. Can you imagine that road trip? We'd get lost. We would have been confused, we would have been anxious, wondering where we're at, probably would have panicked, probably would have ended up fighting, cussing each other out, gotten sick of each other. You know what I'm saying? No. But we trusted in this device called our phones and trusted in this app that we don't fully understand, but we trust it knows better than us. Got there at the right place at the right time. So faith is synonymous with the word trust. In order for something to be faith, let me break this down a little bit more to the level now. In order for something to be faith, it has to be something that you can't see. And it has to be something that hasn't happened yet. Okay? Because if you can physically see it, you don't need faith. It's right in front of your face. If it happened already, then what's the point of faith? Like, it happened. It's done. So, faith can be defined as complete trust and assurance that whatever happened will turn out for your good. Definition of faith right there. And let me tell you this. Everything God has for you, God's promises, God's strength, God's salvation, everything is given to us by what? Faith. Everybody say faith. Now, if we're honest though, life stuff is hard, right? Now, I know every single person in this room, like, you wrestling with something. Like, this is not a, church is not a, 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 like, a place for perfect people. It's a hospital for humanity. So we are all broken, and we all are dealing with something, right? Whether it be an addiction, or it could be anxiety, depression, maybe your fear of the future, not knowing what to do with your life. Let me tell you this. This is my last point. Uh, Jesus comes to give you new life. Jesus comes to give you new life. Now, let me tie it back in. Demons bow at the name of Jesus. The demons that were destroying this man's life, demons that had this man running around like other parts uh, in the Gospels, they say this dude was running around naked. You run around naked and he's hurting people. You imagine a naked dude trying to fight you? Oh, bro, I've, <laughs> yeah, you won this fight, bro. Yeah, you ain't fighting you. <laughs> you hurting himself? to where he was cast away from all of society, to where he lives where the tombs are. He lives in the cemetery. He might as well be dead. You know what I'm saying? So they no longer cared about this dude. This dude's life is miserable. But one encounter with Jesus changes his entire life. Well, see, I think when you're, when you're possessed by a demon, I don't know if this is true, but like, I feel like you still have some kind of control, but like demons are overpowering you. You know what I'm saying? But you still have this ability and this free will to kind of like control it a little bit, a little bit. And I believe that when Jordan saw Jesus, that was his chance. Like, man, I got to run to Jesus. Now, if you notice, uh, while this dude's life changed, it had nothing to do with what that dude did. Had nothing to do with what Jordan did. Notice, 
Jesus didn't make him say a prayer. Jesus said, hey, you got to go to church every single Sunday for about five weeks, and then I'll heal you. He didn't tell him to go to church every single Sunday or Wednesday or go to Bible study. All it took was this man battling with demons to be fully submitted to Christ, and Christ cleans him up. And so when it comes to faith, it is not just about having faith. It's community church. We want to give you the truth, a simple, plain truth of the gospel. Now, I'm not here to tell you this. I'm not here to tell you that if you have faith, everything will work out. I'm not here to tell you that if you have, you believe in God and any God, then that's okay. I, I'm never going to tell you that. You know why? Because it's not the amount of faith that saves you. It is not the amount of faith that saves you. It's the object of your faith that saves you. It's the object. Now, I can believe in, with all my heart, 1,000%, that I could climb up this building and jump off and I'll start flying. I could believe that. I could tell everybody, hey, I'm about to fly, bro. Now, what's going to happen if I actually do that? I'm going to fall. I'm going to splatter my face. Now, I'm going to be flying for like two seconds. <laughs> like two seconds, all right? But I'm actually going to be falling down. And I'm probably going to be dead and badly injured. And so that's what it's like for somebody. We're putting our faith in something that gives us the illusion that we're flying, that we're doing good, temporarily. Gives us the appearance that we're flying for like two seconds, but we're actually falling. And so what we put our faith in has to be based on truth. It has to be based on truth. Because I feel like, man, it's weird because we live in a weird, like, society that cares more about appearing happy and convincing other people that we're happy. But deep down, we're actually really hurting. It's such a weird thing, right? Like, we'd much rather have people convinced that we're happy and post it on social media and tell people, yep, my life is cracking. But deep down, our life is hurting. Well, we can't do that. Let's base our life on truth. Community church, we want to base our life on truth. Now, I'm going to tell you all what this truth is. We're about to get into this communion. Um, Worship team, if you all want to come up and start to close it out. Um, Let me tell you all what truth is, okay? This is what community church believes. This is what the Bible says. Everything in our life is works-based. Sports, the harder you work, the more you practice, the more likely you'll succeed. At work, you do a good job, you work hard, boss going to reward you with more money, good. Works base. School, do more tests, do better on the tests, do all your homework, good. So it's natural to think that our relationship with God is the same way. Count all the good things in my life, and then I will be saved. But the thing is this. We talked about demons, right? Talked about demons and how he can lie to us. He can deceive us. So we end up doing things and chasing things God tells us not to. We try to find satisfaction elsewhere. And in doing so, we break God's laws and commands. And you know what that's called? Sin. Every single person in this room has sinned, including me, including Pastor Barry, including Mike, including Shelly, as sweet as Shelly is, she sinned. <laughs> right? She's a sinner. We are all sinners. Every single person. If you are alive, you are a sinner. Now I know that sounds like, oh, man, he's my uncle to church, man. He was calling me a sinner and all that kind of stuff. I ain't ever coming back to church. That's called me a sinner and stuff. Now, let me tell you what that means, though, because we're all sin. I get it. Because we have sinned against an eternal God. God is forever. God existed before you, before anything, okay? Eternal God He's always existed. We have broken an eternal law, which means eternal separation from God. There is nothing that you can do to earn your way back. Demons have deceived us, bro. That's what it is, right? Because we all sinned. But 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus walks on this earth, 
He's better than us. He is fully focused on obeying the Father. He is in full submission to God the Father. He lives a perfect life with no sin. He gets beaten and crucified and dies on the cross. Now, this, that's the Easter story, right? Last week, we all heard about Easter, Good Friday, all that stuff. Easter story. But three days later, he raises from the dead, appears to two people, and then to 11 people, and then to 500 people, and he ascends into heaven where he came from. And I say this because Jesus says it, right? Jesus says that all who put their faith, their trust in him, and this story is Jesus. Jesus is the object of your faith. You will be given his righteousness. So you know that sinful life that we all have? Like God no longer sees your life. He sees the life of Jesus. God judges you not on what you've done, but what Jesus has done. So not only that, not only that are your sins forgiven, are forgiven, all the sins that you committed, when you put your faith in Jesus, not only are you given the righteousness of Jesus, but you actually are forgiven for all the things that you've committed. So everybody got the communion cup in there. Pull it up. Now, listen, if you believe this message, take it, okay? If you believe this message, take it. The bread symbolized his body that was given up for him, for all of us. And a juice represents his blood, which means the forgiveness of sins. But before you take it, okay, before you take it, I want you all to think about it, okay? Think about this. Think of the severity of your sin. Think of how you are undeserving and unworthy. Then think about the goodness of God and the sacrifice of Jesus and how much Jesus loves you. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, Father God, I thank you for dying on the cross for us. I don't know every person in here, but I pray for the struggles that people deal with. I pray for the person that's been a Christian for years but it's become a habit, and they feel like they lost meaning in their Christian life. I pray for that person that's struggling with addiction to whatever it may be, to, to drugs, to alcohol, to pornography, to whatever it may be. Pray for that person struggling with addiction. I pray for the person that is battling anxiety and depression. I pray it will be removed in the name of Jesus. I pray for the person that has been tormented by demons, that you will cast them out in the name of Jesus. I pray for the person who fears the future. Scared of their marriage, who they're going to marry. Struggling with what school they're going to go to, what job they're going to take. I pray for the person that is finding identity in things other than you, in sex, in alcohol, in money. And God, I pray this, that we all submit and give our lives to Jesus because that is what we were created for. So, Father God, I thank you for dying, for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. May you help us and fill us with the Holy Spirit to worship you and live out your purpose for our lives every single day. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Amen.